Good morning. Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, stand up. Let's give him a hand. Yeah, Matt Vance, his wife Nicole, and little baby Evelyn uh, here from Japan on leave. And yeah, I think they I think they traveled the furthest today. Yeah, so welcome, welcome. Um, and welcome to all of you. It's nice to, nice to have you all here today. Uh, why don't we say, uh, say a prayer before we get started? Uh, dear Lord, I just thank you for bringing us here. Um, I thank you for Christmas. I thank you for, I thank you for all that you do for us in, in loving us and, and, and rescuing us. Um, be with us today. Help me to, to say the things you'd have me to say and help help. Help us to hear the things you'd have us to hear. Uh, again, thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I think I thought I'd start today with a little uh, poll. Um, favorite Christmas movie. Um, now, there's probably going to be different ideas. I'm coming up with four, my four tops, and how about we vote on them, okay? Okay. Here, here, here what it, here's my probably four favorite Christmas movies. Uh, first, A Christmas Story. Anybody like A Christmas Story? Uh, another one that's close, I think. Elf. Anyone like Elf? <laughs> um, okay, how about Christmas Vacation? Any Christmas Vacation? Are some people voting for all of them? I think they are over here. Um, okay, this is, how about old school? It's a wonderful life. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's, uh, let me go through them again. Vote for one. <laughs> now you know all four of them. But be loud. I like the enthusiasm. Be loud, but vote for one. Okay, a Christmas story. Yeah! <laughs> Elf. <laughs> Christmas vacation. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. <laughs> wow, I think it's a wonderful life, has it? Uh, I would not have guessed that, but that might be my favorite too. Um, So I just wanted to start with a reminder. Some of the Christmas movies you enjoy, some of the Christmas stories you enjoy. Um, I read a, a novel recently, and kind of one of the themes was just stories in general. And um, it was kind of about the nature of stories and what is a story, what makes a good story, why do we love stories. Um, and I thought this was interesting because it is seems to be true that we love, we love stories, right? It, it seems to be a part of our human nature uh, to connect with, to enjoy, to appreciate stories of all kinds. Uh, we love to tell and take in all kinds of stories. It could be movies, TV series, novels, fiction stories. You may say, well, that's not my thing, but maybe you like documentaries or, or histories or reality TV, um, or maybe you like sports, even sports, I think one of the reasons we like sports is because it, it tells a story, it's uh, stories of drive and determination and sports have twists and turns and, and um, they end either in triumph or defeat. Uh, you might say you only watch the news, well the news is stories, uh, the news is true stories of what's happening in our world. Um, or supposed to be true, depending on who you trust for your news. Um, or we just love telling stories, right? Like telling stories to your, to your spouse of, um, 
you know, I like telling my wife how I chased a vicious mouse out of the house. Um, she asked me why I didn't kill it because it's going to come back in, but that didn't bother me because I love telling the story anyway. Um, so it, it just seems true that we, that we love all kinds of stories and I, it got me thinking, why? Uh, why are stories so important to us? Why do they seem to be such a large part of, of who we are? And perhaps one reason is that we are, we are God's special creatures. We are made in his image. Um, and God really is the ultimate storyteller. Today, we're four days before Christmas. And I just want to look a little bit at this sort of amazing story God is unfolding. Actually, this, my kind of talk today is based, adopted from a series of articles I read online from Dr. Albert Moeller. And you can look those up if you want. It kind of talks about the overarching Christian story. And part one of the story uh, begins in the beginning with creation. Uh, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we might usually just read that quickly, but let's just stop and think about it a little bit. Imagine right before the creation moment when there was, I mean, what was there? Nothing? Just nothing? There was God, but nothing else. And then God creates, and he makes our massive, wide, entire universe. I just wanted to think a little bit about how big the universe is. I, I was looking into this, and it didn't seem like there's a huge consensus, but there were guesses. Um, our galaxy, the Milky Way, has something like 100 billion stars. Now, you throw the word billion around, and it doesn't really mean anything, but if you were going to count each star, and it took you one second to count each star... If you counted one billion of them, it would take about 31 years. 31 years to count one billion stars. And when you think there's a hundred billion in our galaxy, I think that would take you like 3,000 years to count them, if you counted one per second. That's how big our, our galaxy is, the Milky Way. Well, then astronomers estimate that as far as what they can see, what's visible with their, whatever, you know, their telescopes and things. Um, there are about 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion galaxies. And probably more. So then they make kind of an estimate of the total observable stars at roughly 70 billion trillion stars. And for you math people, that's 7 times 10 to the 22nd. And then each star likely has one or more planets orbiting in it. So there's even more planets than stars. So the universe God created is massive and majestic. Think of Psalm 19.1. <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Uh, so God made the heaven, <clears throat> heavens, but he also made the earth. And he created life and plants and animals of unbelievable variety. And, and he placed earth perfectly, this single planet in this huge universe, orbiting around a single star among the billions other in the universe. And it's, it's placed perfectly to permit life to flourish and to make life even possible. I was looking online and <clears throat> looked up some um, sort of parameters that exist, that even permit life here on earth. Uh, some examples, I, I, you could find lists of, of over a hundred and more, but some examples are, if we're too far from the sun, it would be too cool for a stable water cycle. But if we're too close, we're too warm for a stable water cycle. Um, if, if the orbit was a little different, it would result in season temperature changes that would be too extreme. Too cold in the winter, too hot in the summer. Or, or temperatures on the planet would be too extreme, depending on where you travel. 
Um, if the surface, surface gravity was stronger, the atmosphere would retain too much ammonia and methane. And if it was weaker, it would lose too much water. If the Earth's crust was thicker, too much ox oxygen would be transferred from the atmosphere to the crust. And if thinner, you'd get more volcanoes and earthquakes. Um, like rainfall, if, if there was rainfall was too small, there'd be not enough water for land-based life. It's too much, you'd have too much erosion. I mean, these are just a few small examples of the amazing creation that God accomplished when he made the heavens and the earth. It's such a small phrase in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth for such a miraculous and wondrous and complex beginning of the story. And of course, God made humans. The culmination of the creation story, Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of, image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Humans are special creatures. They're the only creatures made in the image of God. And God gave us the ability to know and glorify him, to work, to create, to feel to reason, to choose, to care for, and enjoy the earth, and to love. What an amazing creation. I think of Romans one twenty. This creation points to God. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. Well, then we go to part two of the story, and this is where the problem arises. We learn in the Bible that Adam and Eve, the first humans in God's wonder for creation, they disobeyed God. They thought they knew better than God, and they rebelled against him. And the consequences of that disobedience, of that sin, were catastrophic. There were physical consequences, difficulty in growing and gathering crops, difficulty in childbirth. There were emotional consequences, difficulty in human relationships. There were spiritual consequences. They were no longer in a right relationship with God. Their sin had separated them from him. And really the saddest thing about this rebellion is that it not only affected them, it affected the entire creation of God. Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. This sin affected creation and it affected us. It's, it's, our, it's our worst inheritance, right? Because through Adam and Eve, none of us are right with God. We all rebel against him, no matter how good we try to be. Think of Romans 3, 10 through 18. It says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We are broken. All of humanity is broken, and we don't have the power to fix ourselves. And you may be saying, thanks, Gary, for the lighthearted Christmas talk. But I agree, this is a dark part of the story. And if it ended here, it really would be hopeless. Um, but God, the great storyteller, is working in this story, and it gets better. God does not leave us slaves to sin. He does not leave us stuck in our rebellion. He does not leave us broken and be beaten and defeated. God intervenes. Now, <clears throat> it may be unfortunate, but 
I'm a child of the 80s. And when I think of the idea of God intervening to rescue us from our sin, for some reason, what I see is like an 80s action movie. You know, like Stallone, Schwarzenegger, Steven Seagal, coming down with like bulging muscles and big guns and just taking out Satan and sin and all evil and kind of throwing in cheesy one-liners as he does it. Going a little further. So imagine, you know, God with this kind of heavenly machine gun or something shooting these spiritual bullets at us and they're kind of going, not, not hurting us physically, but going in and just wiping out all the sin in our lives and, and just, you know, tipping his hat and blowing on the barrel of the gun and saying, now that's what I call holy. But you, but you get the picture, right? Like, I'm seeing God coming big and, and just taking care of business in a kind of bombastic way, majestic, huge way, right? It's the all-powerful creator of all the universe, of all life. He'd come big and loud and fast and mighty. And he'd, he'd kind of wipe out sin in some, some just over-the-top manner. But God did not do what we'd expect. There's a surprise twist in this story. Uh, one of my favorite um, movies that has a surprise twist is Sixth Sense. Has anybody seen this movie, The Sixth Sense? I remember seeing it in the theater uh, for the first time. and It's kind of a scene towards the end of the movie where the the wife, and if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. The wife sort of, she's sleeping or something, and she kind of drops her hand, and a, a ring falls on the ground and kind of rolls around. And at that point, you sort of realize what's going on. And I remember watching the movie in the theater, and my jaw just kind of dropping, like, I think, I, I think it's the only movie I've audibly gasped in. Like, ah, ah. And you can hear people in the theater whispering to each other, like, oh, what? oh, did you see? Oh, la, la, la. that's what happened. Oh, I can't mm. Well, I'm telling you, God accomplished the ultimate surprise twist. And this world has never been the same. Let's go to Luke chapter 2 and just read it. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. <clears throat> Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby 
who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Ah. Whoa! Did anyone see this coming? God the Son, Jesus, who was there before the creation of the universe, who created the billions of planets and stars, and who placed this planet and all life on it, who created humans in his image, comes to earth to rescue humanity from our sin and brokenness as a baby. As a baby. And once he's here, he doesn't, he doesn't raise an army. He doesn't call his angels and start some kind of war here on earth. No, he lives, a, he lives a perfect life. He heals the sick. He makes the blind see. He raises people from the dead. He speaks and teaches with the power and authority of God. He said things like, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then when it was time, he sacrificed himself for us. He died for you and he died for me. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And in that death and resurrection, he rescued us from our sin and brokenness And he makes available to us healing and righteousness and forgiveness. God defeated the power of sin in the least likely way possible. And that same victory is available to each of us. Of course, there's a final part of the story when Jesus will return. He's coming again. And this time it might look a little bit more like my 80s action movie. Um, Probably not exactly, but he's coming in power and might and glory. Matthew 24, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. In Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I like how J.R.R. Tolkien put it. Many of you know him as the writer of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. He wrote an essay called On Fairy Stories, where he sort of thought about this idea of stories and the importance of stories and what, what makes a good story. And at one point in that essay, he discusses the gospel story, God's story. And he says, There is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true, and none which so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. For the art of it has the supremely convincing tone of primary art, that is, of creation. To reject it leads either to sadness or to wrath. But this story is supreme, and it is true. Art has been verified. God is the Lord. 
of angels and of men and of elves. Legend and history have met and fused. All the stories that we love to to read and watch and listen to, that we love to tell and retell, that have been told and retold throughout all history, they point to the existence of God, the greatest storyteller, who is even now telling and guiding and crafting and intervening in his story. His story is one of creation. Of of creatures that have rejected their creator. Of God invading this earth in the form of a baby. And of dying for us so that we have the opportunity to be reconciled to him. So I guess we get back to the question, why do we love stories? I guess I don't know for sure. Um, I think it could be because we are made in God's image. And loving creation and stories is something he's placed in us. And maybe it's something God placed there to give us a desire for that ultimate story. The, his ultimate story of creation and fall and redemption, rescue. So, you know, maybe the next time you hear somebody tell Ralphie he's going to shoot his eye out. Or or, or those lights on the Griswold house that light up the whole neighborhood, right? Or Buddy pour all the syrup on his spaghetti. Or George Bailey running down the street saying, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! You know, the next time you're seeing that, remember that we love all kinds of stories, but only God's story will rescue us and provide complete fulfillment and make us whole. Just in closing, I'd like to read a, read a poem. It's by Catherine um, Hankey. She wrote it in 1866. Actually, I'm reading part of a much larger poem that was wrote and later turned into a hymn. Um, you, you might recognize it. It goes like this. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to a little child. For I am weak and weary and helpless and defiled. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in. That wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget it so soon. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. Tell me the story softly with earnest tones and grave Remember, I'm the sinner whom Jesus came to save. Tell me the story always, if you would really be in any time of trouble a comforter to me. Tell me the same old story when you have cause to fear that this world's empty glory is costing me too dear. Yes, and when that world's glory is dawning on my soul, tell me the old, old story. Christ Jesus makes thee whole. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you, God, for the rescue you accomplished. We thank you for Jesus coming here. We remember that especially on Christmas. Jesus coming here in the form of a baby, taking on the form of of a human, living a, a perfect life for us, 
being an example for us in this world and then dying for our sins. We thank you for that. Help us to to go out and remember that throughout this Christmas season and, and really help us to remember it throughout all of our lives. Help it to be the forefront in our minds and our thoughts. Help it to affect how we act, how we, how we treat others. Help us to love you and love those around us. We can thank you for, for all that you do for us. Um, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.